Hey folks, Lucas here. This week I'll be making the film plane. The film plane is a very important factor in determining the quality of a camera. The flatter it is, and the better able the film is to lay flat, the better the end photograph will be. Here you can see the film plane from my previous camera. Not very pretty, is it? This one was brazed together. For the one I'm making now, I wanted to take it a step further and weld it together, making it much stronger and hopefully more accurate. I start the process at the mill. Like in a previous episode, I'm using a sheet of MDF as a super glue arbor. I find a piece of scrap that is the approximate size, and I glue it down. What I'm making here is the main face for the film plane. I'm going to mill all sides, that way I know it's perfectly sized and square. Then I'm going to mill an opening in the front that will create the frame. This little Chinese mill I have is just big enough on the y-axis to make the cut. Now comes the very fun process of cranking on these handles for what feels like ages. I really wish there was some way to add power to these knobs. Maybe some sort of power feed. With the outside perimeter now cut to size, I'm left with which is probably my favorite shape, a square. And I'm about to make this square even more interesting by adding another square inside. And to ensure that this square is as square to the other square as possible, I'm using both a scribed line and a DRO, or digital readout. The size of the inside square is determined by the film I'm using. This camera uses medium format film, which is roughly 63 millimeters tall. The size of the image is going to be just under 60mm square. That's actually how I decided to name this camera, the Landers AL6. The image is 60mm square or 6cm square. The AL stands for aluminum, in case you're wondering. You can theoretically make this frame any size you want. Keep in mind there are standard film sizes printed on the back of the film that are used for film advancing, and those sizes are 645, 66, and 69. So if you wanted to use a different frame size, you would have to come up with some other way of indexing other than using the viewport on the back of the camera, like this one does. With the part now cut, I pop it off and stick it in a bath of lacquer thinner to help remove the marking fluid and the glue. This is going to take a while, so while I wait, I grab a few pieces of 3 quarter inch aluminum and cut them to match the size of the frame I just made. Uh, you know what, this process didn't take very long, the glue still seems to be stuck to the part. So back into the bath it goes. So while that process continues, let's get the welder set up. I'm using an Everlast PowerTig 200. This is a 200 amp TIG welder, but to get the full amperage, I need a 220 volt outlet. And surprisingly, my basement apartment in Brooklyn does not have one of these plugs. So I have to go with the standard 110, which only gives me about 125 amps. Ideally, I would have a few more amps, but I don't have any other options, so I have to work with what I got. So let's check on the chemical bath again. Eh, that's good enough. I'll just use a knife to scrape off the rust. One thing I've learned recently is to wipe off the metal with turpentine before scrubbing with a Scotch-Brite pad. Apparently, a Scotch-Brite pad can embed contaminants into the metal. And as you may know, in previous episodes, I've been struggling with contamination. So I go ahead and give this a try. And also, just to be safe, I'm wiping it down right before welding as well. As you can see here, I've made a small jig for myself out of a few C-clamps and a piece of angled aluminum. This will be here just to make sure everything stays square during the initial tack welds and then can be removed. And now with the jig removed, I can start filling in the gap. The process goes really fast. I'm definitely learning more and more every day and I think it really shows.
For the other side, I do the same exact process. And you know what? I'm pretty happy with the way these welds turned out. Now, one of the most important features of this part is that it has to be perfectly flat. If this part was more aesthetic, I would probably just hit these corners with a belt sander to round them over. I want to make sure this surface is as flat as possible. So I'm going to take it one step further. A few passes with a fly cutter should do the trick. I spent some time indexing the part on the mill so that I know it's as flat as possible before I start. And then I let the cutter fly. The tool's sticking out pretty far, so I don't want to spin the machine too fast. With a small machine like this, I can build up quite a bit of vibration, even with a tool this size. Now with the film plane perfectly flat, I can just round over the corners with a sander, give it a good polish, and this part's now finished. I'm extremely happy with this part and how the welds turned out. There's almost no porosity and it looks like I have great penetration. Definitely a step up from a few weeks ago when I made the main body. And now I can show you briefly how it's going to look when I put in the main body. I don't want to attach it just yet because there's a fair bit of calibration involved. This part will have to be a very exact distance from the lens mount and be perfectly parallel. So I want to make sure everything else is in place before I attempt that. When the time comes, only a few tack welds will hold this in place. I don't want to run a full bead anywhere because the heat may cause a slight warp that will distort the final image. So for now, the part is complete. Over the next few weeks, I'll start making some of the smaller components involved with this build. And soon, hopefully very soon, I'll actually start assembling this camera. Everything I do takes place in my positively tiny workshop that's in a glorified hallway in my basement apartment in Brooklyn. And I'm very curious to hear about other people's shops, small or large. So go ahead and leave a comment down below letting me know about what solar space you have. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to leave them down below, and I'll try my hardest to help you out. If you have any comments about anything I've done here, any advice for me personally, go ahead and leave it down there as well. I'm very interested in hearing what people have to say. And finally, if you're interested in following this project or some of the other projects I have planned for later on, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified as my videos come out. And with that, I'll see you next time.